Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. Okay, you come for God's Word? Amen. I pray that you have. I pray that's why you're here, and this is, this is a real important message. You may have noticed during the prayer time and during the opening, I spoke a lot about signs and wonders, and spoke a lot about the miracle working power of Jesus Christ our Lord. And church, I don't know about, about you guys, but how many of you believe that Jesus can still do wonders, and He can still do signs. I believe that. I believe it with all my heart. And you know what? One of my favorite prophets also believed it. Isaiah, which I refer to Isaiah a lot. We're going to hear a lot from Isaiah tonight. Uh, you know, in the Christmas program, uh, Tour of Christmas, uh, we're going to actually, Isaiah is going to come visit us tonight, praise the Lord. And he's going to be here tonight. And so you want to make sure we're also going to hear from Micah. We're going to see Hosea's going to be in the house tonight. You know, I wonder if he's bringing Gomer. You know, and, and uh, Jeremiah's <laughs> going to be here tonight. And, uh, you know, we're going to have a lot of the prophets in the house of God tonight. So you've got to make sure you're here at 6 o'clock so you can visit, all right, uh, with these wonderful prophets of God. All right? And so, church, what's real important is to know and to believe that the greatest wonder that God loves to do, more so than just even uh, the miracles, more so than just even, you know, the great acts of faith, you know, that, that, the, that the believers had. Isaiah, we're going to find out today, Isaiah understood that the greatest wonder of all was God's creation and the fact that humans are created in the image of God. God loved to manifest himself through his people. God loved to manifest himself through those that believed and who God was. And believed that all things are possible with God. Uh, Isaiah, we're going to find out today, in the midst of giving the virgin birth prophecy, in the midst of giving uh, the, the Emmanuel prophecy, in the midst of giving the, the prophecy of the Christ child, we're going to find that Isaiah understood in the midst of all that, that he and his own children were wonders of God. They were great wonders of God. They were created in God's image. Isaiah understood that his own children were blessings from God. Isaiah understood that he was anointed and gifted by God and forgiven by God. Remember last night at prayer meeting, guys, we looked at Isaiah uh, chapter 6. Uh, those that were here, uh, and five, and five, Isaiah 5 and 6, where, where Isaiah declares, Here I am, Lord, send me. Isaiah understood who he was as a wonder of God himself. I asked you a question today. Do you know and believe today that you too are also a wonder of God? You are a, you're created in His image. You're a child of the King. You are the apple of the Lord's eye. You are a great wonder who was created by God. That God formed you while you were in your mother's womb. Praise the Lord. I get excited thinking about there's a baby that's, that, that's been conceived and a baby that's being formed in my wife's womb right now. Praise the Lord. I get excited about that church. I do. And I think about the fact that you know, that God and all of us and the wonder and the beauty that we are, we are awesome creatures of Jesus Christ. We are, we are His church. We are wonders, praise the Lord. When was the last time that you looked at the mirror and you said, wow, I'm a masterpiece of the Lord? Church, you are wonderfully and fearfully made. You are created by the, by the great potter who molds us and shapes us. And guess what? God does not make mistakes. The thing that's cool about Isaiah was he knew this and he believed it. He knew this and he believed that his children were wonders. He, he believed and he knew that he was a great miracle of God. The question is, church, do you believe that you're a miracle of God? Do you believe you're a wonder of God? Do you believe that your children are? Now, not just when they're like up to the age of five and the next thing you know, they become a terror. Actually, church, your children are wonders of God just like you are. If you're here and you're an adult, you're a wonder of God. 
If you have a teenager, and I know that apparently is the hardest time to raise a child, is when they get to be preteens and teenagers. Guess what, parents? Your teenagers and preteens, they're wonders of God. Amen. Parents, have you ever told your children, I brought you into this world, I can take you out? <laughs> My mother told me that quite a bit. I tell you what, though, church, I pray that you will understand that even our teenagers are wonders of God. Amen. Church, think about it. Look at how old Mary was when God sent the angel Gabriel to pay a visit to her and said, you, God has found favor in you and that the Holy Spirit is going to conceive a child in your womb. Mary was nothing more to 12 to 14 years old. Church, everybody that's in here right now is either a preteen or an adult, a preteen, a teen, adult, or a senior here today. And it's important if you get nothing else from this message other than this right here, is you are a wonder of God. Amen. He's ready to finish what he has started, and you are something beautiful because you're created in the image of God. Think about it, church. Jesus, when he was born 2,000 years, of course, he's the Alpha and Omega. He's been around from the beginning of time. He's the creator of the world. But when he was born of a virgin 2,000 years ago and came to live, but most importantly, to die. Think about it. Jesus was born, and when he was born, Mary had to carry him to full tomb, or tomb, term, sorry. Had to carry him to full to ter term on the way to the tomb where he would die. But when you think about it, when Jesus was born, he had ten fingers, he had two arms. If Jesus was to get cut, he would bleed. Jesus would feel pain. Joseph, most historians believe that his earthly father, Joseph, would die somewhere between 14 and 16. And that's simply because uh, Mary had other children. She had James, Jude, and John. And then she also had at least two girls, Mark tells us. It says sisters, meaning plural, that Jesus had sisters, at least two. And so for every two years, basically, a child would be produced, and Jesus being the oldest, of course. And so, uh, the, and, and Joseph's no longer recorded both in Bible or uh, in history. So most likely he died shortly after the youngest was born. And Jesus had to, Mary was a single parent, basically, uh, the majority of her child as she was rearing those children. And Jesus was a big brother, if you will, the same brothers that would disbelieve him and John. Uh, and, and uh, you know, but also, though, praise the Lord, they would see the light and they would understand who Jesus was and would go on to write at least two of them, books of the Bible, James and Jude. But church, what's really important here is, is that you're created in the image of God and Jesus was just like us. There was a song that came out in the mid-90s. It was um, when I was in high school. I think it came out in 94 or 95. What if God was one of us? Church? He is one of us. He's God with us. He is Emmanuel. And he is, as, as the book of Matthew declares, his name shall be called Jesus, the Son of God. Praise the Lord. If you guys would be so kind as to stand with me for the reading of God's word in a message entitled, The Wonder of God. Isaiah chapter 8, and we're going to be reading verses 11 to 18 here today. Isaiah chapter 8 beginning with verse 11, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples, and I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are, we are for signs and wonders in Israel. From the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. 
You may be seated. Church, maybe you read that passage of Scripture and you're not sure what this passage of Scripture means. Well, let, we're going to talk about it here today because I find that as more and more people, when they look to Scripture, whether it, especially the prophetic books, they don't have an understanding. Well, church, we have to understand that just before Isaiah declares this in Isaiah 8, he's just giving us the Emmanuel prophecy. He has just told us in Isaiah 7 that the Lord would be born of a virgin and his name shall be called Emmanuel. And if you continue going forth into uh, Isaiah 8, you will find that Assyria has, has invaded Israel. Israel has fallen into idolatry, especially after uh, Solomon's day. Israel divides into two. You have the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. Assyria is the enemy. Jerusalem's under siege. Uh, Israel is not repenting of their sin. They're, not, they're, they're falling further and further away from God. And in the midst of one of Israel's most lowest points in time, the lowest points in their history, we have the Emmanuel prophecy given, we have the virgin birth prophecy given, and we have the, we have the statement that, that mankind is a wonder of, of our Lord and Savior. We have a belief through, in the prophet Isaiah that God still wanted to do great and wonderful things in the midst of Israel's and one of Israel's lowest times in their history. Do you know some people here today may be in a lowest point in their life? Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you're in the deepest valley of your entire life. Maybe you're in a very deep valley that you haven't seen for many years. Maybe since your childhood. Then again, maybe you're in the greatest place in your life. Maybe, maybe things are going very well for you. And 2014 has been a wonderful year for you. And this is going to be a great Christmas season for you. Or perhaps you're somewhere in between. Wherever it is, church, I pray that God's Word will speak to your heart and I pray that God's word will be manifested greatly and that God will do wonderful things. Because even in a bad time, God's ready to make a wonder out of your life. God's ready to reveal maybe a calling in your life. God maybe is ready to, maybe ready to take you to the next phase in your walk, spiritually speaking. God may be ready to do something great in your life just like he was in Isaiah's life. As we break down these verses, we're going to, to look at the historical piece, if you will, of Israel 2,800 years ago. And we're also going to look at the piece of, 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 of our Lord 2,000 years ago when he was born of a virgin and compare it to today. And church, I believe God's word is it, it never returns void and that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But church, if you, again, if you get nothing out of this message except this, you are a wonder of God. You must believe that. You must believe that God loves you and cares about you and is ready to take you to the next level with Him. You must believe in the midst of all that's going on, a troubled economy, uh, all the repression that we see around us, all the legal woes that we see around us, you know, all the brokenness and pain that we see around us, that God loves the River Valley and He desperately wants to bring a revival to this area to where lives will be changed and souls will be saved. You must believe that and that you are a part of it. You're not a piece of trash. You're not yesterday's news. You are, you are a wonder in, the, in God's eye. You are the apple of His eye. You are created in His image. And you say, Pastor, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I'm worthy of God. Well, guess what? Nobody is without the cross. And via the cross, you can be found worthy today. And you can be restored to a right relationship with God. And through Jesus Christ, the Son. And you can begin to have life and life more abundantly as defined in the Bible. But let's break it down. Verse number 11. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand. This is after Isaiah had just declared that Assyria is going to invade the land. The land is invaded. Invade uh, Israel was making a deal with the devil. Basically, uh, Israel was, was kind of negotiating, you know, uh, with the enemy. They were bowing uh, to, a lot of the, to the, a lot of the deity of that day. Uh, they, were, they were making some horrific mistakes. You know, after, especially after the death of Solomon, uh, God had punished Israel. The kingdom is divided. But the priests and the people, they're not, and the kings, they're not returning to God. They're not seeking God for restoration or forgiveness. Matter of fact, they were getting further and further in the world. Do you know, church, we can make that same mistake today? 
we can make that same mistake as we see as we see things getting so bad. And you know what? We can simply say, well, the world just looks appetizing. We're just going to do that. Do you know, church, that God still wants us to be holy in 2014? Israel, did, Israel knew that, but they didn't care. They were going to do what they wanted to do. They were going to live how they wanted to live. And, and here, church, God is going to come in verse 11 to Isaiah with a strong hand. Think about this. When God speaks, like for example, as I'm preparing service, sometimes God comes with a strong hand. Say, Lord, that's a challenging message. I'm not sure how that's going to go over. God really doesn't care how the message is going to go over. God just wants his word to go forth. Amen. Church, because God is God. Okay? And certainly he wants us to respond. But, but God is, God's not going to be too upset if you're upset with him. God's been dealing with people upset with him throughout many years. God's been dealing with that. He dealt with that with Moses. He dealt with that uh, with Abraham. He dealt with, I mean, God have been, has been dealing with that uh, for many, many years. And he spoke with a strong hand to Isaiah the prophet. And the Bible says in verse 11, and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people. God says to Isaiah, I do not want you walking in the way of your Jewish neighbor who is following the ways of Assyria. Idolatry, who Allah, you know, all the all the different all the different face, uh, you know, I'm sorry, Baal, Allah comes later. Baal, you know, God, God did not want his people walking in those ways. Church, do you know that there should be something different about Christians? There should be something different about our attitude about Christmas. There should people say, why is why is why is the tea come out of Christmas? Why has Referring to the, the Christ, we say Christmas rather than Christmas. Why, why, is, why is Christmas even, uh, some, some school districts and, and some states, even though it's a federal holiday, have taken Christmas off of their calendar, you know, and they just call it holiday, and they just call it different days, and, and all this other stuff. And maybe you've seen on Facebook all the different, uh, the uh, University of Maine said, we are not allowing you to decorate. We want nothing to do that gives any, any hint at all to a Christian holiday. Whether it's a wreath, whether it's a tree, whether it's a, certainly a manger scene, even here in the University of Maine, where our tax dollars go, some of you have loved ones that have gone there, and you know what? There was a little outcry, but the president, the director there, the board of directors over at Orno, they didn't care. They didn't care. You know, and so Christians have to make a decision. Like, okay, wait a second here. You know, should, am I going to remain silent or am I going to speak out? Well, here is, here is Isaiah. Isaiah, God says, I don't want you even having anything to do with them. Amen. I don't want you touching the things of the world. I want you to be there strictly for my glory Amen. and my benefit. Church, that's what God's wanting for us in 2014. God is wanting us today to choose for whom we will serve. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. He's looking for us today to choose who we're going to serve. I don't know about you, but I want to be a modern day Isaiah. I want to ask for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I want to be able to say, you know what, Lord, I'm in your corner. I'm with you. And here God comes to Isaiah with a strong hand and instructed Isaiah and said I, that, that I should not walk in the way of this people. Now this is really important, church. This is how God operates. God first looks to religious leaders, pastors, priests, scribes, and he looks to kings, in our case, presidents and governors. But if there's not a response from, from uh, God's leaders that he's placed in authority, by the way, he raises up kings, he raises up pastors, then the people must respond to God and his word. And then if the people do not respond, then you, can, then you basically know judgment's on the horizon. Well, church, I tell you what, I want to be able to speak out for God and bring God's word to you and bring instruction to you and say, hey, don't even go down that road. Don't go down the road of the world. Stay away from the world because the world is going to pull you away from Jesus Christ, just like it did Israel. Church, there's so many times you could say deja vu. If you study the nation of Israel and you compare it to modern day United States of America and many other nations, the way they're going, you're going to say, wow. You're going to say, wow, praise God, Israel's been reborn. Uh, praise God, you know, Israel has asked for sin for the sins of their fathers after Hitler uh, and World War II. But church, I tell you what, the United States, as Israel's been getting closer to God, the United States has been getting further away from God. That's right. And if we think we have a faith that's different than what Israel did, God's chosen people, we got another thing coming. 
And so this Christmas season, may we say just as, as God told Isaiah with a strong hand that I should not walk in the way of this people. Amen. Church, may you be found walking in the way of God, not in the ways of the world. Then God gives instruction saying, verse 12, do not say a conspiracy. Now, church, why God says this and this component about a conspiracy is because you've got to remember Assyria is trying to conquer Israel. And, 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 and I, God did not want Isaiah to get caught up in this negotiation. God wanted Isaiah to have nothing to do with the enemy. Nothing to do with the one that wanted the land of Jerusalem, the Holy Land. God, don't, don't even go down that road. Do not even give a hint, you know, to where. And today, guys, in 2014, we live in an era where there's a conspiracy for everything. Sports, politics, there's a conspiracy for everything. There's got to be a conspiracy. There's a conspiracy for the boxing match. There's a conspiracy for the Patriots game. There's a conspiracy for, for President Obama, you know, and his, and his negotiations with other countries. Everybody's bringing out these different conspiracy theories, you know, to what's going on. The last time I checked, all we got to do is read the Bible. And if we understand the Bible, then as these events occur, you guys say, you know what, I don't care, you know, these different theories. I'm looking at what God's going to do. And he, by the way, in the scriptures, he names names. He declares who's, who's going to be righteous and unrighteous, uh, just so you know. All right, but do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. That kind of reminds me of when Jesus, when he was on this earth, and when Matthew 24, when he's given the signs of the times, he tells the disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Here he says, you know, God says, you know, hey, don't worry about being troubled. Don't worry about being afraid. When the angels visited uh, Mary and Joseph, but especially Mary, and as, and as Gabriel visited Mary, and Mary was, and, and the news was given that she was found with favor, and that she was going to give birth to the Messiah, the Christ child, Emmanuel, she began to be afraid, she was scared, she was confused, and the angel said, do not be afraid. Well, church, we live in the last days, but you don't have to be afraid. Why? Because you're a wonder of God. You're created in the image of God. You're his child if you're a believer here. You have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear should you breathe your last. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Church, you have nothing to fear today. Why? Because the one that was born of a virgin, he lived on this earth, he died, he went to hell, conquered hell, rose again the third day, and we had victory. And the, and the book of Revelation says, guess what? We win. We have nothing to be afraid of. We have nothing to be concerned about. Here God is telling that to Isaiah. Think of how the Isaiah must have felt because he saw his fellow Jewish, his fellow Jewish people all going by the way of the world, all going down the road that Assyrian and Assyrian gods were going down. All, you know, all this other stuff. And Isaiah, you know, he was basically as rare as a $2 bill in that day because there wasn't a lot of righteousness around him. Isaiah was just giving the, vir the virgin birth prophecy, the, the, the Emmanuel prophecy. Here, you know, there wasn't that many people God could trust. There wasn't that many people that would step up and speak on behalf of God and that God knew, you know, loved him. Church, think about this. In the River Valley, how many people really love God? Last night at prayer meeting, as I do every Saturday night, Lord, who loves you with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, and all their strength. And last night I was praying, Lord, not only who loves you, but who really trusts in you. Who really trusts in you in these last days that you will be faithful to your word. Can God count on you tonight? Church, I, or today, church, I tell you what, God could count on Isaiah. And God came, comes forth to this statesman, Isaiah, with a strong hand and says, hey, you know, don't worry don't worry about a conspiracy. Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Church, I think it's time for Christians to start making a stand. Amen. Churches, well, I don't want to lose my tax exempt. Well, come get our tax exempt. That's not going to detour me from preaching the gospel. That's right. That's right. Amen. You know, church, this is, it. this is important stuff. We get scared and we begin to cower. You know, and we begin to, uh, you know, some of us, uh, you know, we're, we're scared to even raise our hand and confess Jesus Christ as Lord. I wonder how many today, right now, if we were to take a moment, if you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, how many would stand? I wonder, church, today, you know, even if we were living in a persecuted country, just like we've seen in the news, you know, of believers who are having their heads beheaded because they would not denounce their faith. And we can't even lift a hand in a classroom. Amen. 
We can't even, you know, lift a hand to declare Christ. But Isaiah was told, hey, don't worry about it. Don't be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. Verse number 13, this is what you should worry about. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. Who should you fear? The Lord. Who is the only thing we have to worry about? That's not a holy reference for God. Everything else we don't have to worry about. Why? Jesus said in Matthew 6, hallowed be thy name. And the fact that we're going to give an account. And that's all Isaiah had to worry about. That's all Isaiah had to worry about in the midst of the virgin birth prophecy and the Manuel prophecy and all the other, and some of the others we're going to talk about tonight. All Isaiah had to worry about was praising God and, and knowing one day he's going to give an account of his life. Church, when we, when we live in fear and we walk around as scaredy cats, we play right into the adversary's hand. What the only thing we should worry about is hollowing the name of the Lord. And let him be your fear. The him there is capitalized. Let God be your fear. And let him, which is also capitalized, let God be your dread. Church, I tell you what. Here, God's going to hold praise assembly of God accountable for all that we do. Church, God is blessing us time and time and time again. God is blessing us wonderfully. Many of you have been blessed by God just since last week. Some of you have been blessed by God this morning. Some of you here recently, I've had the privilege of giving a call to you and say, hey, I've got great news. God's been good to you. We need to talk. You know, God's been good to you. God's uh, amazing hand is upon your life. Uh, you know, God is, God is setting the captives free. God is meeting needs, praise the Lord. You know, God is an awesome God, and God loves to do great things. But here, church, the only thing Isaiah needs to worry about is God. Is God. Now why does God give Isaiah this great responsibility? Because for Isaiah, for such a time as 750 B.C., he was called. For us, for such a time as this, we have been called. We don't have to worry about who our enemies are and what folks are going to say. Maybe it's the Satanist. Maybe it's the atheist. Maybe it's the government official. Whatever it might be, we don't have to worry. We don't have to worry about our loved ones, we'll say. When we say, you know what? Um, 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 yeah, we can have Christmas dinner, but before we eat, we're going to read the Christmas story. Well, I can't, you can't do that. You know, we're going to, you know, all that kind of thing. You know what? Well, then you can say, you know what? I'll be there a little later, but I want to honor Christ on his birthday. Or whatever the case may be, whatever your family does, whatever, whatever it might be. I think it's time for Christians to start speaking out. It's time for Christians to start speaking out. Do you know, in Maine, it's not only... It's not only Thanksgiving that they're talking about because it's a state law. You can't retail stores can't be open. But do you know in Maine they're talking about to where Thanksgiving will now be open? They're trying to push it through. We're only one of three states that does this, by the way. The old blue law. But it's not just Thanksgiving. They're talking about Christmas too. Have you seen the big signs in the convenience stores? Open Christmas all day for your convenience. And church, uh, all these different things that are that are happening, uh, the president is refusing to call Christmas a federal holiday. I shared that on Facebook. Church, this is an, this is an important piece, but we can't worry about that. What we've got to worry about is no, we've got to represent God. God is counting on us to be his voice. God is counting on us to speak for him and to share what we believe. Because I tell you what. Sometimes you don't know what you got until it's gone. And it's time for the Christians to have their voice heard on behalf of our Lord and know. And the only thing we have to worry about and to fear is God himself. Verse 14, he will be as a sanctuary. He will be as a sanctuary or a dwelling place, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Now, church, some people say, what is Isaiah saying here? Isaiah is saying here 2,800 years ago. That if you want to trust God and you want to live for God, your life will be a sanctuary for Him. However, if you don't want to, your, your life's going to be a block of stumbleness. Your, your life is going to be a, a tragedy. Your life is going to be misery. Your life is going to be difficult. You're going to be stumbling left and right. Which is why he can say, hey, he will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Church, I tell you what, I don't want to stumble, do you? Jesus said we're not to be a stumbling block to one another. But instead, I want my life to be a sanctuary. I love it when we sing that song. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. 
And that's exactly what God is doing. God is preparing us to be a sanctuary. But here, and then God continues to say through Isaiah to both houses of Israel. Church, think about this. Both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. God was looking at Israel and treating Israel as one. Do you know we're the body of Christ? But we're one body? Jesus Christ is the head? If we want a revival, if we want God to pour out His Spirit, being unified is extremely important. In the book of Acts, you will see, after Pentecost, the church was unified in the upper room. They were unified in the power of prayer. They were unified in who Jesus Christ was. They were unified in who the Holy Spirit was. Do you know that we need to be unified? And if we are not, God can bring forth judgment or He can withhold blessing. In church here, it's so important to understand that God wants to be as a sanctuary here. God wants our life. Do you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Your life can be a sanctuary for the Lord. But Isaiah declares there in verse 14 to both the houses of Israel. Now church, this is so huge because Assyria was already coming in. Israel was divided. The kingdom years had begun. One of the saddest parts in Israel's history. Under King David, the, the country was unified. The country was huge. His son, his son Solomon takes over for the first ten years. It's great, but then he falls off the truck. And then with Rehoboam and Jeroboam, it, it falls off the truck even further. The kingdom divides in two. And there's Isaiah as a prophet amongst Israel that is divided, kind of like President Lincoln during the Civil War. 1861 to 1865. President Lincoln, he viewed himself as a president, not just of the Union, but the Confederate States was not in his vocabulary. That is the United States of America. Jefferson Davis, his counterpart, you know, they're the president of the Confederacy during that point. Lincoln would not view him as the president of the United States. He would not, he would not, he, that was America, that was land that God had given to us. They were part of the original 13 colonies down in Georgia and the Carolinas and, and all the other sub, uh, southern colonies, southern states. But church, here is Isaiah as he's looking out and he sees that, the, that Israel is divided in two. Do you know, church, that there are many churches today that are divided and splitting left and right? That's right. Think about it. For every church in America that we build or open up, we're closing three today. Ten years ago, it was for every church we built, we're closing two. Now it's three. There was ever a time that we needed God's house to be open, it's today. But it seems to be going the other direction. Because of church splits and, and, and petty things. The body of Christ not being unified. Well, here is Isaiah, and he says, Hey, to both houses of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Do you know that the adversary is attempting to trap you today? There's a snare waiting around the corner just to lure you in, just to bait you. And what's that? What's the bait? The bait is worldly things. The bait is fleshly things. And many Christians are falling hook, line, and sinker, even when it comes to Christmas. Even when it comes to next to Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday, Christmas is, is the granddaddy of them all. You know, the celebration of our Lord and Savior and His birth. And many times we miss the boats. Many times we can't explain the Christmas story. Tonight, church, if you don't know that much about Christmas, come tonight and be educated because we're going to be touring Christmas, Old and New Testament. Be educated tonight. Come out tonight so that you can give an account, so that you can understand, and also so that you do not fall prey to a trap or a snare that's right around you. Israel had fallen prey to a trap, the trap of Assyria, the trap of the adversary. They had fallen prey to the trap. And where did it start? It started in their homes and it started in the synagogues because of pleasure and sin. And it carried all the way to Assyria. History tells us Assyria wasn't even in thought about invading Jerusalem when King David was on the throne. Think about it, church. Think about it. Now the world sees the American church vulnerable. The enemy of America sees us vulnerable by the people that we're elected. Do you know that, that the Muslim world views us as only interested in one thing, and that's sex? That's how they view us. They view us because we had a president who was impeached in 1998. 
they view us as a nation involved only in sex because of the pornography industry, which, by the way, next to gambling, is the fastest growing industry in America. They, they see all the children, you know, that, that, that don't know who their dad is. They see shows like Maury Povich where they bring in a dozen dudes to see who the father is and they still can't find out who it is. And they see us as an easy target. As an easy target. Well, here they saw Israel and Judah, the divided kingdom, as an easy target. And what was Israel going to do? There was no way divided that they could overcome the enemy unless they called on God. And Isaiah's message was to bring that hope to the people. For them to call on God. And for them to call on the one who would restore them. And Emmanuel, God with us. The one who would come and bring hope. What is our greatest hope today? The return of Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not on who we elect president in 2016. Amen. It's not in the fact we just re-elected Governor LePage for another four years. Our greatest hope in Jesus Christ returning. Amen. But until then we must preach his word and pray for a revival in this land. Amen. And it starts with us. It starts with us, church. It really does. And we are a wonder. Why does God want to do this? Because we're a wonder to Him. We are created in His image. We are, we, are, we are His children. We are the apple of His eye. He desperately wants to bless us. He does not want Rumford and Mexico and Dixfield and the River Valley to just go by the wayside. He desires to do great things here for us. Because we are wonders. We are His creation. We are special to Him. We are, we are the apple of His eye. Verse number 15, and many among them shall stumble. Church, do you know that many people are stumbling all around us? Many believers even are falling away from their faith. We've talked about that. Many shall stumble in Israel and Judah. Many of them were stumbling. Many of the priests, they were stumbling. They were lewd behavior, Isaiah calls it. Drunken, drunkenness and idolatry and, and, and fornication and all that was going on. All that wicked sin against God, and many were stumbling left and right. They were falling down like dominoes. A lot of that's happening today. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're not in the right place today with God. But guess what? God's ready to pick that piece of domino up. God's ready to pick you up and make something beautiful out of your life. Because He loves you. That was the message of Isaiah. And Isaiah knew he was a wonder. Isaiah knew his children were wonders. They were gifts of God. You're a gift from God too. God created you. He knew you before He even formed you in your mother's womb, before you were conceived. Verse number, continuing on, verse 15, they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken, or taken, captured by the adversary. Do you know, church, today, just because God loves you, He may have to sit back and watch you fall? Why? What separates you from God? Sin. God's not just a genie in the bottle who you can rub his lamp and he just come out and just say, okay, I'll do this, I'll do that, we'll all leave and sing kumbaya, have a great day. It doesn't work that way with God. He, he sat back in heaven and watched Assyria take captive Israel and Judah. Because why? He gives free will to every person here. You have a free will choice today to serve God or not. To worship him or not with your life. You have a choice today. Israel had a choice. And God sat back and that's why he can declare. They shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Satan's trying to seek, kill and destroy you. But you have hope today. Which is found through Jesus Christ the Lord. Why? Because you're a wonder. You say, Pastor, I'm not worthy of that. I'm not good enough. I'm not. Church, if you got breath in your body, Jesus loves you. Amen. And God's ready to heal you, deliver you, set you free. You know what I found as pastor, people that say that, many of them have never been loved their entire life. Their childhood was filled with, with drunkenness and abuse, have no idea what love is, which is why we have many failed marriages, which is why we have brokenness, so many uh, incarcerated or in teen challenge or passing away prematurely, whatever it might be, because they don't know what love is. They don't know what it's like to be loved. In just a few moments, we're going to be remembering the Lord's table. There's no greater love than to lay down your life. Jesus laid down his life. Why? Because he loved you. And we're going to remember his death and his resurrection today. Church, if you're here and you don't know what love is because you, you've never seen it defined, you've never seen it lived out, well, try Jesus. Try Jesus. 
Jesus wants to show you that he loves you and loves you unconditionally, that he cares for you. He's ready to forgive you. He's ready to wash away your sin. He's ready to give you a fresh start. And you know what, church, to others that have never experienced love, our job, according to Jesus, is to love our neighbor as ourself. So we have to love those that have never been loved. Sometimes it may take 18 years, because that's in our culture, it's 18 years to love, to raise up. But sometimes it takes a lot of love. It takes a lot of patience, just like you're raising your own child. It takes a lot of <laughs> forgiveness. We have many adults today that know, have no idea what love is. One I was talking to and working with, uh, even though she had been through many abusive relationships, she even told us that we'd, we'd rather be in an abusive relationship than to be alone and unloved. Think about it, church. Look how confused that mind is. God's not the author of confusion. The adversary is. They shall fall and be broken. They shall be, they be snared and taken capture. The adversary, he's seeking to kill, seek, kill, and destroy you eternally. Verse 16, bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. What does Isaiah say? You know, here, God, the, this is so important as Isaiah, you know, is understanding as he is, as, he is, as he is taking hold and taking charge of God's instruction that was spoken to him with such a strong hand. Church, we need to bind up the testimony of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If, because if it, if it lets loose, you know, if we let it loose, it's going to fall away. It's going to fall out of our fingers. You know, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to fall through our grips. We have to bind it up. We have to seal it. You know, Isaiah wanted those that were working with him and those that believed in what, what God was speaking through his prophecy, through the prophet Isaiah, you know, that it had, to be, it had to be sealed, it had to be understood. Today, are you convinced and are you persuaded in what you believe? Think about it. Do you believe Jesus was really born of a virgin? Pastor, that can't be. Do you have what Mary's response was to the angel? How can that be that I'm going to be the mother? I've never been with man. Do you believe that he really was? Or, do you, or is there a part of you that sits back and says, well, maybe, maybe Mary did step out on him and you know all that. Maybe the Bible's wrong. All those kinds of things that may go through your mind. Or do you believe in the Christmas prophecy of Isaiah that he would be born of a virgin and that's exactly what Mary was 700 years later when Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in her womb. Seal the law among my disciples, he says. Seal what you believe. Seal what you believe as a follower of Jesus Christ. Do you know what you believe? You know, we saw that in chapel Friday. Put a plug in. Come out to chapel. They did a great job. Brandon wanted a video show. And there's a great part. The last skit in the skit guy's presentation, you know, was where the believer could not explain anything about what he believed. He was just <coughs> fumbling over it. And the atheist had a field day with him. We call the Bible the manual. We call, well, the Bible's all I need, but do you know anything about it? You know, can you, can, you, can you explain and articulate, you know, the Christmas story? Here, Isaiah, he knew what he believed. He knew God had spoken to him. He knew the word. And he said, hey, we've got to seal it. We've got to seal the law of God. Verse 17, and I will wait on the Lord. Church, this is one of the hardest things you'll ever do next to coming to Christ is waiting on God. God's timing is not ours, but I'll tell you what, the key to waiting on God is worship while you wait. Amen. Lift up the name of the Lord. Here Isaiah declares that I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob. What was God doing? God was permitting all that stuff to take place. Why? Because of free will. The, the majority were going down the wrong road. Why is God allowing America to go further and further away from him? Why? Because it's the free will choice of Americans. What's the answer? Christians standing up and being heard. That's the answer. Stand up and be heard. Voice your opinion. You know, make a stand for the Lord. Here Isaiah is saying, hey, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I understand he's in his face. Notice Isaiah is not arguing with God. He understands God. Church, if, you want, if you've read the New Testament or if you've been to prophecy class, you understand the times, hopefully. You understand God's character and his nature of what he's doing. Who hid his face from the house of Jacob. Notice when Isaiah declares the house of Jacob, Israel is unified. He didn't separate it, northern and southern kingdom. The house of Jacob, all 12 tribes, the entire nation of Israel. And I will hope in him. 
Isaiah, as a wonder of God, knew where his hope was. Church, sometimes, especially people that struggle with pride, they think it's all about them. Church, it's not. It's not. Well, that's the way we've always done it. Church, that's not how it rolls. Our hope has got to be in the Lord. You know, well, I'm just going to, I just can't stand this politician or that politician. Church, the one who wants to feed you at, at dinner time is not the governor that signs the budget or that Congress passes. God is the one who wants to meet your needs. Amen. Isaiah's hope was in God. It was not in the government. What was the government doing? The kings of the state? They, the kings after, after Rehoboam and Jeroboam and even Rehoboam and Jeroboam were going away from God. What were the priests doing? They were sitting there having affairs with other women. They had drunken events right in the synagogue. Look at what we're doing today in America. Many churches are bringing in yoga. Many pastors sitting there doing the yoga stance and doing the, all that stuff that they do, chanting and, and going deeper and deeper into the, the Hinduism and the spirit world. Bring it on in. Bring it on in. That'll bring the people. And all the other stuff that goes down. Well, here Isaiah knew his only hope was in God. It couldn't be a politician. It couldn't be a religious leader. Church today is your hope in God. And as, I, as Isaiah was waiting on the Lord, he, is, he was understanding his hope was in God. And verse number 18, I love this. This is the wonder part. Then we're going to close and go into the Lord's table. Go to the Lord's table. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Church, I love this, especially as a father to be. And that, and that piece is here. Lord, here I am, here my wife is, and our child, when he or she is born in May, okay, we're, our child is going to be raised to love God. Amen. And to serve God. And to know that he or she is a wonder of God. And here is Isaiah. And by this point, his, his, his children would have been older. But he says, here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. Church, I love this. Do you not know that you are a gift from God? Your children are gifts from God. You have a responsibility to pray for them and love for them and for 18 years take care of them. By the way, children, you have a responsibility to take care of your parents when they are old, the Bible declares. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. And then I love this part of verse 18. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. Isaiah said, Lord, just as he said earlier, here I am, use me. But use me so that you can use my life to be a wonder for you all throughout Israel. Amen. Church, will we say the same thing for all of the River Valley? Lord, use my life to be a wonder for you and my children. So you say, Pastor, I got kids, I got responsibilities, all that stuff. You know what, God? You know what? That's not going to fly with God. That's not going to fly. I was just training them up in the way they should go. Church, that's not working. Parents especially, that's not working. Here Isaiah understood. And he had his children with him. And he says here, for we are for. When he says we, he's talking about his family. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. Are you for signs and wonders in the River Valley? Do you want to see God do things in this River Valley that you would never think possible? And by that, that may mean, church, God begin to bring some people in here that you don't necessarily like. Or some people in here that you might work with. Or some people in here where God is going to say and answer that, to want us to answer that question, who loves me? And you have to publicly confess your faith in the Messiah. Church, it's, it's so important to understand. I hear this a lot. Well, Pastor, so-and-so is going to church down there. We don't necessarily get along. So I don't want to come and be a, a, a nuisance or whatever. And I think, don't you think God's bigger than that? God's already restored that relationship. Somebody wants to mock God, then be careful. Be careful your foot shall slip in due time. God's a big God. Amen. We are for signs and wonders in Israel. I love that. Isaiah wanted God to restore this divided nation. Isaiah wanted God to, to forgive those that were sinning willfully. Isaiah wanted to see the blessings of King David's reign return to the land of Israel. Church, we said a couple weeks ago, hey, we want to see God restore the River Valley. Do we really? Do we 
really want to see that? Think about it, church, what God would have to do. God may have to close down your favorite drinking hole. God may have to, uh, you know, really wake up folks and say, and this is, by the way, I shared this last week in Bible study, but, but come July, if you're receiving benefits from the state, expect them to decline. Get ready. I'm trying to warn people as much as I can. America, the, the people of Maine voted overwhelmingly for welfare reform and, and energy assistance reform and all that stuff to get out of the red. So there's going to be new changes, especially next month, or the new House and Senate's already been voted in, and, and when, when the session convenes January 4th, or I'm sorry, January 5th, Monday, January 5th, expect more changes to be voted in. Expect God, and God may have to really wake us up from the bottom. You know, I believe it's going to be a grassroots effort. Any revival is in history. It was where God got a hold of the people. And God got a hold of the people from the and, and then began to just move greatly all the way up the line. You study history, you'll know that if you have. If you haven't studied, you'll find that out. Church, I believe God's going to begin stirring us, stirring hearts professionally as well. God's going to begin stirring hearts in great ways, but you have to have a desire to say, hey, we are for signs and wonders in Israel. And lastly, at the end of verse 18. From the Lord of hosts, who dwells in Mount Zion. Where were these wonders going to come from? God himself. These wonders were going to come from the throne room of God. And God was going to use his people. People like Isaiah and his children. And God's going to do the same thing for us. What's the answer of God? How is God going to be the answer? He's going to use those that trust him to be part of a great move. And I pray... You here today, trust in the Lord. I pray that you here today, you know, are ready to, to be used of God. Sometimes things have to get worse before they get better. Anybody ever told you that? Yeah. Isaiah would never see a great move of God. He would see Assyria rule and then Babylon rule and then Persia rule. Not him, but this is how history would go. Then he would see Greece rule, Rome rule. The Muslims, Europeans, all the way down through history until 1948. The Lord's not waiting this time 2,800 years in America. He's going to come long before that. But church, I tell you, I really believe this with all my heart. I really do. If the church doesn't wake up and say, Lord, put me in the game we could very well see exactly what Isaiah saw. The country in which he loved fall apart. 1861, we fell apart because of states' rights and slavery. Should the Lord tarry, we're going to be perhaps to fall apart ideolo with ideology. We could fall apart economically. We could fall apart socially. Do you know that the enemy is already within this country? Many places. Militarily. Think about this. This isn't so far-fetched that one day maybe a president has to give the command for the military to shoot down one of our own planes because it's been hijacked and it's heading to a certain destination. Do you know after 9-11... President Bush, after he was notified of what was going on in the plane that went down over Pennsylvania, did you know where it was heading? Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Had it not come, had it not fought, had those guys in the Let's Roll movement stood up? We don't know for sure, but many believe the president had already given the okay for the military to take that plane out of the sky. Because it was heading to Pennsylvania Avenue. That could happen. If we don't take the blinders off. And it's we're so far gone to where we've even forgotten Christmas. Blessed is the nation whose God is Lord. Are we really blessed that we've forgotten Christmas? May we be found speaking above any other voice. And knowing that we are wonders of God. And that God loves us 
And he wants to use our life to go and do many wonders for him for such a time as this. Isaiah said, we are for wonders of God. The question is now, do you believe you're a wonder of God and that God wants to take your life and do a wonderful, wonderful miracle for his glory and his honor and his praise? Father. Hello. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services, Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m., worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.